All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Daniel Lewis. I'm the US CEO of Legal on Technologies. Our software helps legal teams find and fix contract risks in commercial contracts with a combination of AI technology and expert legal content written by experienced attorneys. I'm so excited to be in conversation today with Richard Tromans, one of the very best analysts in the legal industry. Richard runs Artificial Lawyer, where he covers the changing business of law, primarily through technology. And Richard recently wrote a very insightful and provocative piece called The End of Lawyers, Not Yet. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So Richard, thanks for joining us. And if you could, give us a brief introduction to yourself and your background and your interest in AI. Okay, yeah. And thank you very much for having me on the show, uh, Daniel. Um, very, very quick intro. Some of you perhaps know me. I'm the founder and editor of Artificial Lawyer, which is a uh, news and views site started in 2016, focused on innovation, as Daniel was saying. Um, I'm on a bit of a sabbatical, but the, the site is still going and we're still doing events and such like. Um, in terms of the focus, what, what brought me to Artificial Lawyer was realizing during the first wave of legal AI, sort of 2015, 2016, that the business of law might actually change. I'd spent, I'd worked as a journalist, and then I'd moved over into management consulting, advising and working with others on advising big law firms on business of law issues. So mergers, hiring partners, uh, improving profitability. Shall we open an office in Frankfurt? If we do, will it make any money? What's the billable rate out there? How does that integrate with what we charge in New York? So very much the business of law kind of stuff. Um, globalization kind of came to a bit of an end, really. The A lot of the most exciting stuff finished. I mean, it was kind of like, well, what next? And it was almost as if the, the legal world had reached a bit of a plateau in many ways in terms of big strategic moves. And then there was this huge wave of legal tech, new startups, some of them AI, others more broader types of automation. And like a little light bulb went off in my head and I thought, this is actually going to change the business of law. This is going to change the whole industry. If this catches on and billable work, and we'll come to that in a minute, if billable work really starts to change, this is going to be amazing because this isn't just like introducing a bit of technology. This is actually going to change what is an $800 billion industry. This is going to be tremendously exciting. So I started writing about it and well, the rest is history. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that background in the business of law gives you a really unique perspective on understanding the dynamics of why and how some tech adoption has gone quickly and some has gone less quickly than, than people expect. So we're going to get a, a quick poll out to the audience so that we can understand this audience too. Um, so we're going to ask you what describes your current role and what are your feelings on the use of AI um, in legal. And as those results come in, um, I'll tell you that just sort of housekeeping wise, at the end of this session, we'll open up the room to at least probably 10 minutes of Q&A. So you can use the Q&A icon in Zoom to ask a question and uh, during the course of the webinar, anything that catches your interest, and you can upvote questions that you find interesting. We'll try our best at the end to answer as many as we can. Um, so let's see if we have uh, poll results yet. Great. So it looks like we've got about 26% of the audience from law firms, 15% from in-house, 20% from legal tech companies, another 20% from uh, advisors and consultants. Um, Hi, consultants. Hi, consultants. <laughs> um, and then amongst uh, outlook on artificial uh, AI, or AI in legal, 67% um, very excited about the potential, 32% cautiously optimistic and very few naysayers. So we knew that we were gonna have a self-selecting group uh, coming into a, a, a conversation like this. Um, but I'm, I'm a little bit surprised because right before the webinar, we were talking about some of the people who are quite fearful about what AI will mean for jobs in legal. And that's, I think, where I wanted to start with you, Richard, which is, this idea or fear that AI could potentially replace lawyers has been bouncing around for at least the past 10 years, but it yeah. feels like it's gained a lot of new momentum lately. So what do you think has changed and why is it being taken more seriously now? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think we should give a hat tip to Richard Susskind, who uh, who framed it with the uh, the end of lawyers question mark that book, which of course you know I mean people were talking about it perhaps beforehand, but he certainly deserves credit for really uh, getting people talking about it in depth uh, many years ago. Um, why is it different this time? I think it's partially because people who work in legal tech, people who perhaps journalists. Um, people who work in technology in general, who have played with ChatGPT and immediately saw how incredibly good it was at dealing with text, you know, because law is, is text, basically, it's either spoken or written or both. And something that can utilize it so apparently easily and generate such value so quickly, and of course, we'll come on to hallucinations and errors and that, you know, further down the line. But at least at first blush, first contact with it was like, oh my God, you know, that thing just summarized a 10 page document in like 0.5 seconds. And I've just read it. And frankly, it's pretty good. I mean, of course, after about a week's studying, they realize that some of the stuff is made up. But at first contact, it was like, wow, this is incredible. Um, there was no, and also I think there was no training. And I think that was one of the interesting aspects. If you look at the very first wave, um, we, we can quibble about what actually was the first way the legal AI, but if we say 2015, 2016, with a big uh, increase in use of natural language processing software, we call that the first one. Um, training was very, very much part of it. And there was a lot of disillusionment because people realized that training was not something they wanted to do. They didn't want to be responsible for it. This chat GPT appeared at least on face value to be able to get good results very very quickly very very impressively and i think that kind of freaked people out and also i think you might say the ground had been prepped you know um these arguments these ideas had been circulating for a long time you know the first way we we've been here before to some degree with these arguments because you know the end of lawyers do you remember all the like the shiny android images you know every magazine would have those still getting those still does huh? yeah, and they've come back they've come back you know it's like um i suppose it's like fashion isn't it? if you wait long enough it all comes back like you know um and i think that's why i think so one <clears throat> the the ground was prepared the arguments were well circulated and I, I think you know the second key point is just simply that people were perhaps knocked off balance overcome by the apparent power of it without getting too much now of course we're getting pushback it's like oh what about hallucinations what about the guy in new york who made the false cases and all that kind of stuff and that's taken a bit of a wind out of it and then of course now we've got copyright cases and all kinds of cases coming up against open ai people are starting to slow down and i think for me and i've been people have probably realized it's a bit against a lot of the hype because i lived through the first hype wave and i don't want to see that happen again because what happened was there was a lot of hype people got disillusioned and then pushed back and some people even walked away i mean i've met some firms who literally tried out some nlp tools very early on 2016 2017 didn't do what was expected and then just gave up mm. which was you know a bad idea if they'd stuck with it they would have got better results I would ha hate to see that happen now, that people get overhyped and then get disillusioned and give up because I think there's an enormous potential value here. What are some of the use cases that you're seeing today that you think are most exciting or what are you excited about in the near term, say the next one or two years? Uh, okay, well, I think as a baseline, you know, let's remember that there's a ton of legal technology that does the vast majority of things that let's call it when we're probably going to jump between gen ai and llm but you have to forgive us if, if that isn't your preferred terminology but we're probably going to bounce between the two um if you look at the technology now what it's doing is effectively much the same as what came before so reviewing documents well people have been doing that for years now uh redlining people have been doing that um uh, analyzing a document looking for um, areas in the text where you might want to add alternative text from a playbook well that's been going for years as well clm companies have been offering that uh litigation um research you know case text and so forth um very effectively building on technology that is already well developed so you know it's an interesting question is is this llm technology as far as legal is concerned really doing anything radically different is it, you know ra is it radically radically different like a complete sort of quantum leap away um i'd say generally not you know i think a lot of it is very similar you're just taking it on i think some of the things that do 
strike me as surprising. I think the summarization capability is amazing. And I think the, uh, I haven't seen every single tool on the planet, but I've never seen a traditional NLP tool summarize so rapidly and so accurately. Um, I think the other thing that really excites me is what you might call automated negotiation. Hmm. I think that, I think the conversational ability of, for, and I think this would be, have to be limited to very, very simple contracts. I would hate to see very important contract, complex contracts that affect a lot of people or a lot of value being effectively handed over, sort of outsourced to an AI. I think we're not ready for that. Definitely not. But very, very simple things, very, very simple things like an invoice, you know, an order for, I don't know, 100,000 units of cornflakes between Walmart and Kellogg's. You can automate that. You know, you've got playbooks, there's protocols, they just argue it out, you use game theory, you get to a point, then you get onto various clauses and caveats and bam, 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 it's argued out and it's done. And then, of course, you get a human in the loop. You don't want to completely automate everything. And then, you know, they sign off on it. And, you know, companies like Pactum, for example, have looked at that. Um, I think that's interesting. And I think that is a departure from what was there before. But just to summarize, I'd say that broadly what, LLM technology is doing in law is extending to some degree what was already being done. And perhaps this new technology is getting there faster. It's doing it without as much training. And it's perhaps with the right guardrails getting high accuracy more rapidly. Yeah, interesting. So let's ask one more question here for, for the audience. Um, and this one is around when is the first lawyer going to lose their job specifically mm -hmm. because of AI? And Richard, you've been running a Twitter survey um, that indicates a prevailing view that AI will lead to some lawyers losing their roles within a relatively short period of time. What does that survey data tell you in terms of gauging market expectations? What does it tell you about people's understanding of legal business models? Well, um, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, we have been prepared since we were kids to accept the thesis that new technology knocks away old technology and old jobs. You know, so typists, bang, destroyed by the um, uh, word processor and so forth. Uh, paper replaced by email. And these are very, very, very compelling arguments, you know, because, because they're so simple and you can see them and you can test them. It's very, very easy. Walk into an office, walk around and say, hey, where are your typists? There aren't any. Well, QED, you know. Um, with law, I think it's different because we're looking at a very, very, very complex set of processes and behaviors. You know, <laughs> it's not just one thing. Talking about replacing typists with the person who's doing the work, handling the word processing themselves because they have spell check, you can type easily, you can raise, blah, 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 massively increases productivity and so forth. That is a very, 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 very narrow use case. It's a very specific output. Law is thousands of different behaviors and actions and responsibilities and interactions. So they're not the same thing. You know, it, it's, it's actually an enormous leap to go, oh, look, uh, this tool can review a document very quickly. Ah, QED all lawyers are going to lose their jobs. And it sounds, you might say it sounds, oh, it sounds this, this is really logical, but actually the more you think about it, you realize actually that doesn't make any sense because there are so many other things that lawyers do. And even if it was the case that we get to a point where, and we'll get into this in a minute, which is the economic side of it, who's to say there aren't new things that lawyers will do? You know, um, the professions have been incredibly good at widening their circle of what, of what they do, of what they offer, creating new value and value expectations constantly evolve. Uh, look at accountants. I mean, did Excel spreadsheets destroy accounting? You know, did all those relatively cheap and easy accounting apps get rid of accountants? No, because at the end of the day, you still want to rely on an accountant, don't you? You know, you need that person. So it's it, what seems to be really simple and logical actually isn't. And this is before we even get into the economics of why would a yeah. law get rid of their own uh, fianas. And so let's see, so we've got the results from this poll, which is 23% say it's never going to happen. 41% say within two years, 20% within five, 14% within 10. 
Yeah, I just yeah that's interesting because in some ways, right, there's this uh, expression that uh, I'm going to get it wrong, but like we're going to overestimate its impact in the near term and underestimate its impact in the long term, right? Yeah, um, it's possible. It's possible. It's possible. But well, let, let's get into the economic thing. So for me, yeah. that's that's the real clincher, right? It's okay. So look, here is a a law firm. A law firm. It is owned by its partners. Its primary objective is to make money, right? That is its goal which is then distributed to the equity partners. They want to make as much money as possible whilst being within the law, serving their clients to their best ability. They make their money by selling time. They sell time by using the leverage of junior associates, middle ranking and senior associates. This pyramid of labor is a factory that produces time or it produces billable time. If you want to make money, you want to have as much of that billable time as possible, right? If you then, if you then start to cut away those associates, you actually reduce your ability to make money. Now, the, the only way around that would be you would have to massively uh, increase your your billable rates, which would be presumably unjustifiable. Which I don't see how that's going to work. Um, <laughs> Or, and this is the interesting thing, you could move to fixed fees. But again, you see, just because you use fixed fees, it doesn't mean that you would get rid of your own fee owners. What would be the point? So let's say I'm the managing partner of a law firm. I've got a hundred junior associates beneath me. We go on to fixed fees. Uh, we invest very, very heavily in technology. So we really maximize tech. Um, we don't need as many uh, associate hours or as much associate effort to complete each project. So I can now do more work. I can take on more clients, but my cost base is relatively the same, except for the additional software licenses. I'm now going to get even richer, right? Why would I cut away the base beneath me? You know, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, it's like we're still thinking like we're a cottage industry, you know? I mean, no law firm has more than a tiny fraction of the global legal market, right? A tiny, tiny, tiny fraction you know, which is kind of absurd. I mean, I know in the US you've got strict conflict rules, but globally it wouldn't necessarily apply. There is no reason why law firms couldn't be much, much larger. In fact, you could argue that they should be much, much larger. There's no reason why a law firm couldn't be using a ton of AI technology, using fixed fees, almost, let's say, for 80% of their work. It's throwing the kitchen sink at everything in terms of process improvements, you know, really leveraging the data they've got, crystallizing past presidents, feeding everything in, really, really leveraging everything they got, doing all of that and actually increasing the number of associates they have, not decreasing, because every yeah. single fee earner is a little engine that makes time, right? Or if you're not selling time, they are still getting the clients where the client wants to be, you know? So... The long and the short of it is, it, it, it doesn't make any economic sense. It would only it only makes economic sense if no if there's no economic aspect to it, and the only thing you're trying to do is save money. Now we move over to on the in house side. That is the more interesting thing, and I think there is possibility there. And I think certainly at perhaps around the contract management side, I think people who are just involved in very very low level contract management, so like re just reviewing sales agreements and they're not expected to really give any advisory input and they're, they're virtually paralegals right i think with well-managed ai and experts on top to keep plenty of humans in that loop and managing the process and ensuring guardrails and reducing risk and so forth yes i think there we could lose people definitely because it would make sense if you're a very large corporate, if you're a bank in a compliance department, say, and you've got a bunch of very, very junior lawyers like quasi paralegals endlessly going through compliance documents every time a, a new customer comes in. It's, it, I mean, but then you could argue, well, hold on a minute. Is that even legal work? Is it, and this is the other thing as well. I mean, lawyers used to be a relatively small bunch of people. It expanded as Western capitalism and you know technology exploded in the 80s and society became much, much more complex and there was more data and more rules and regulations and so on and so on, which has effectively stretched and pulled the idea of what a lawyer actually is into a whole new territory. So you could argue that what's happening now with AI effectively is also sort of like bringing it back. It's kind of honing us back down to what actually a lawyer should be. 
Um, so will some roles go? Yes, I agree they will. I think it will take a while. Uh, but then I guess you get some really interesting debates about are those roles really what we would describe as being uh, an all singing, all dancing lawyer? Because if you're just managing the, re the compliance review of the same type of document again and again and again, and you will be until you retire, I mean, it's not a great job anyway, you could argue. But anyway, that's a discussion for another time. But yeah, so I, I think for the big law firms, I think, no, I think you're kidding yourselves. It's not going to happen. Uh, the reason why people are losing jobs at the moment on the transactional side is because there's been an enormous drop in transactional work in the US. Really, really quite extreme. That's what's leading to people getting chucked out or um, associate uh, bans being delayed from moving into yeah. the firm. On the on the in-house lawyer side, again, I think there's more regulation every year. GDPR I mean, in the US, every single state has got its own um, data privacy coming in. You've got ESG, which is like you know, I mean, it's like mutating like this horrific virus like all over the world. Just, you know, where the hell did that come from? And it's it's just multiplying and multiplying the needs for legal input. And then now, of course, using AI will also create regulatory issues. And then next year, there'll be something else and something else and something else. So is, is this the time to be taking a knife to your well-trained, very smart team in-house? I would say that's a really bad idea right now. You know, I think actually, and I think we'll go back to, you know, Daniel, you know, what you've been doing with your company is helping smaller legal teams using tech to act as a force multiplier. Yeah, that's definitely what we see more in our conversations, which is in-house teams interested in technology for several different drivers, right? One is budget, but another is workload, speed, being able to turn things around for the business faster, consistency of the work, quality, risk management, team satisfaction, as you noted, right? There's a lot of different tasks that folks can do in a day-to-day, -day, and most people don't want to be doing the same thing again and again. Going back to the business question, though, you know, over the last 10, 15, 20 years, probably there's been, I think it's pretty easy to argue a lot of under adoption of technology, right? We were joking before the webinar that a lot of firms are still asking about e-signature. Do you yeah, think yeah. now is different? Do you think generative <laughs> AI, from new wave, like is going to play a different factor in driving a speed of adoption? No, no, I don't think so. No, no. I think I think there's going to be a lot more marketing um, like there was in 2015, 2016. Uh, I always remember this one firm that made a big splash in 2016. They sent out this press release. And then there was a rumor going around town that the license for the AI company, the legal AI company, was paid out of the marketing budget. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was <gasps> shocked, shocked, you know, gambling in the casino. You know, how dare they? Um, so I, I knew the managing partner and I, I had a chat with him and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, yeah, we never use it. <laughs> you know, we don't use it at all. I thought, oh, bloody hell, you know, geez, you disillusioned me. Um, so I don't think it's going to be any different because also, I mean, what we don't, I mean, in some companies you have a hippo, you know, the highest paid person's opinion, right? In law firms, you effectively have the oldest person's opinion. I don't know what the acronym is for that, but I'm sure you can work it out. You know, I mean... The, the, the pyramid is, is is very powerful, super powerful. And the people who own the business are the oldest people. And, the, I, you know, this is funny. I say that the people who are at the top of the plateau are amongst the oldest people in the entire business, right? Uh, why should they change things? I believe they'll only change things if they have external pressure, real external pressure. And I think that's one of the good things in the UK about the big four, because the big four has actually acted as a bit of a catalyst to stir up things so you've seen a lot of uk firms building alsps building uh, legal ops divisions um doing you know some very interesting innovative stuff outside of just legal tech um but for me it, it's all going to come from the clients i mean you know i was talking to someone else the other day in a, in a webinar the if a law, law firms change a little bit it doesn't really change much if a big bunch of banks right or insurance companies together you know they go to some conference they have a cocktail together and they all agree yeah right no morality rates on anything unless it's super super exotic or super super life and death or you know rather than just sending um an rfp asking for some completely vague 
uh, inputs on do you use AI or how can you help us with legal tech, which is usually just fluffed and has no real meaning. If they actually show how they're economically going to implement technology in the work that they do for the clients, how it's going to change everything, <clears throat> that would be awesome. And But again, will the GCs do that? You know, uh, I've met a lot of GCs, as I'm sure we all have who are in the audience. Um, there might be some GCs here. Hey, GCs. Um, how many are really putting their foot down, their, their feet down and saying, right, it's all going to change, guys. So, you know, we, this is a watershed moment. You know, I mean, I know we could have done this stuff years ago. And we've been talking about it and we've been talking about it at conferences. Well, you know, something has really changed. Will that happen? It could happen. And then the, and then I think a third point is what about the shareholders, right? So I was talking to one in-house lawyer the other day and he said, yeah, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much we spend. It's only like 0.5% of revenue. And I said, well, okay, so point one response to that. If wasting money is irrelevant, what on earth are any of us doing? You know, why don't, why don't you just outsource everything to Woxtel Lipton? just like everything they'll just charge you a million an hour and everybody's happy right so he said well no, no of course not that would be ridiculous so i said well so money does matter he was like yeah so i suppose it does um and then he said yeah but still it's only like 0.5 percent of our revenue what we spend on on legal and i said yeah but think about the shareholders if i'm blackrock i've got investments in a thousand companies if every single one of those companies is wasting money on legal inefficiency on mass, I'm actually costing a lot of money to the people who put their money into BlackRock. So on mass, on a global scale, inefficiency in the legal world, you could argue, is almost like a tax on the economy that is sucking out uh, capital resources that are unnecessarily being spent. And also you could argue that on the legal and risk and compliance side, that cor if corporates could actually even redirect that money they would be better prepared. But so much of their budget is getting sucked into work that could be done in a different way. So, I mean, I think there's a whole, I mean, we had enough time to get into this, but there's a whole mass of talking points around that, that, you know, the, the clients, I think, you know, it's, it's their ball game. You know, it's, it's, if, if they push, the law firms will change because, you know, they do not want to miss a single client. They really, you know, I mean, they, most of the big most of the big law firms in the US and the UK over the last twenty years have thinned out their client lists enormously. Mm. You know, they've been chucking out they've been chucking clients out of the window for for years and years and years. Not now, probably not since two thousand eight, but for years and years and years they were clearing the books. They didn't want clients who weren't going to generate big jobs, who weren't going to generate complex, interesting, high value work. Because there's just no point. It's just wasting the associates' time. Right? If you want to get rich, don't do tons of donkey work unless you can charge the client a ton for it, like you might for a private equity fund who just says, hey, it's not our money anyway. But anyway, another subject. The, you know, the, the, the trick is, is that now, particularly with so much competition between the US and the UK uh, for the larger corporates, I think there's a real, and now you've got the big four jumping in and you've got a variety of ALSPs coming in and so forth. I think you've got a real opportunity now for the clients to actually wield a bit of their buying power. You know, do you think that's going to take place in a way that's different than it has over the last five, 10 years? So, you know, Professor David Engstrom from Stanford, he's made this point that you made, which is the, the maybe the lack of change or the pace of change in large law firms has not been driven by the technology or lack of technology. It's been driven around culture, by culture. Um, and so if the driver to change that culture has to come externally from clients, um, does the latest wave of AI spark that? Does it catalyze it or it, no? It could, it, could, it, it could catalyze. I mean, this is, I think, a point that Casey Flo, and he's going to shoot me for pronouncing his surname wrong, but Casey Flo. Yeah. Exactly. I was pronouncing his name wrong. Sorry about that, Casey. Um, he made a very good point, which is that, you know, what might happen if I'm paraphrasing his thoughts here but that what might happen is that basically generative ai technology becomes so universal that effectively it capsizes the the boat of opposition that even if law firms and in-house lawyers are like hey no, i don't want to use this it's you know tough too bad everyone 
in the rest of the economy is using it. It's like email, it's going to be like internet and so forth. The argument against that, the counter argument, is to say, well, the internet actually just boosted productivity in the legal world. It didn't really lead to business model changes. Email just allowed a lawyer to basically send you know, red line documents back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and create more red lines. It's wonderful. It's like this kind of like, you know, mushroom effect. So technology to, to that extent effectively just enabled into ironically inefficiency to, to balloon um through through sort of you might say the ease of productivity. Um LLM technology is slightly different in that, like as mentioned, it's just building on what's already there to some degree. You know, the the tools that can do these things already exist and they haven't been used very much. So except on the probably I think e-discovery and uh, litigation research, probably the two areas that have really, really succeeded because I think they had to. Um, so I guess for me, the I don't think there's any automatic reason why the legal world should change. You know, I mean, I was thinking about this the other day. I think in 2016, I would say there was like a four to five percent chance that this new wave of tech would in, would encourage the rethinking of the legal business model and the whole legal sector as a whole and catalyze change. I don't think the tech in itself is going to change the world but I think it could catalyze it and then sort of ironically it would then come behind the philosophical change and enable that change to actually happen so it's it's not the AI makes everybody change it's that people go well hold on a minute hey shit you know if you can automate all this stuff why aren't we charge why aren't we working on a, on a fixed fee and then you start to remodel the firm you change your business model and so forth and they go well if we're going to start on if we're going to start doing this then we need more tech hey, let's bring that AI in. Let's really integrate it properly. And let's not just have it in a kind of pre-bill. Um, and this is another issue, I think, is that you've got pre-bill legal tech and you've got kind of like billing legal tech. The vast majority of legal tech is used in a, in a pre-bill stage. In fact, some legal tech companies are even at, at pains to tell people, don't worry, this won't impact your billable work. This will help you to get through very, very rapidly the stuff that is either very, very low in terms of billable rates or is not billable. So it's almost like they're kind of like catering to this pre-bill philosophy. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any any automatic reason why. However, I think that because LLM technology is an improvement with guardrails, I would say there's a 10 to 12% chance of it catalyzing real change now. So that would mean there's about an 88% chance that nothing changes. But I think it's, it's still a huge improvement on where we were five years ago. Yeah. And so what do you make of the notion that like, and we got this question from the audience, rather than thinking of AI replacing lawyers, lawyers who use AI replacing other lawyers, or sort of lawyers who use AI winning out against uh, lawyers who don't. Do you buy I mean, that? Well, I mean, I mean, that's the individual cool. level or the organizational level. I know, it's, I know it sounds pretty cool. It sounds pretty cool. But if that's true, then why why hasn't Wachtell Lipton gone bankrupt? And all those cool law firms in the AMLA 100 between about 70 and about 50 who do use a lot of technology uh, in part to act as a leveler and so forth. Uh, why haven't they displaced Simpson Thatcher, Wachtell Lipton and so forth? Um, I don't think it's that simple um you know the internally and internally as well i mean again you know will a partner will an equity partner look more favorably on an associate who goes to the innovation team and brings down a tool and really utilizes it to shave off billable time uh than the associate <clears throat> who very very you know diligently you know works till four o'clock in the morning and racks up an extra two hours well they'll probably sack the guy who uses the tech um, and another point, and I'm going to thank Conan Hines uh, for this, is I was asking him about, you know, well, you know, it does tech allow you to go home early? And he said, well, no way. You know, if you, if, if you finish a job, you just get given more work. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, so this is why it goes back to the economic thing. You see, it's, I mean, tech based efficiency only works if you have an economic model that is integrated with that approach. I mean, if, if you're a car company, you can't charge more because the Tesla arrived a week late, right? In fact, imagine if you imagine if you actually incentivize speed 
in the legal world. Imagine if you actually incentivize this. We'll, we'll, if you can finish this deal two days early, we'll pay you double. But we don't want any more people on it. We want the same number of people, but we want you to finish it two days faster than, than normal. Now you've got this incredible uh, impetus to rethink how you're doing shit, you know. And then that would be that would be extraordinary. Yeah, and those incentives do exist within companies, which is interesting, right? You'll we consistently hear this, right? The difference between taking ten days to, you know, turn around a sales contract and forty-eight hours could be the difference between closing the deal in the month or not. And so there are kind of real monetary incentives that line up with that. But um, I I posit that it's fairly rare in the law firm setting to have sort of speed-based bonuses obviously there's like contingency work but that's more about the outcome more than the the timeline i'm sure there are some interesting time-based examples but well well, i mean again i I mean the other people know more about it than me and i'm not no expert on u.s billing strategies but there there was something about the the twit the uh the twitter sale the i'm not sure which party i I presume it was elon musk in in his typical fashion i could be wrong uh please correct me audience who demanded it suddenly get finished a lot faster than they were expecting who basically said i want it done by x time or x date uh which then suddenly rushed the uh, the process forward um and and sometimes of course that can happen in in a deal you know like the deal timetable suddenly gets advanced particularly in an m&a deal you know because suddenly like you think you've got weeks and weeks to do it and suddenly bang you know everything gets rushed to the next weekend um but generally as you're saying you know lawyers don't get encouraged to go fast for obvious reasons because if you're working in an environment where you haven't crystallized any knowledge where you don't have any tools that can leverage that institutional knowledge which you trust and you're just telling people to go faster 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 well you're going to increase risk aren't you so obviously telling lawyers to go really fast without any safeguards is a bad idea but then think about operating in a world where you've crystallized all the firm's knowledge and it's immediately tappable and you've put in the right safeguards. And it's also because you've got the right data architecture and protocols in place, you can access it and you can access it in a meaningful way and it can slot into your Word documents or whatever it is you're using. Now we're, we're, in, you know, we're in a different ballpark now. Now you're like, well, hold on a minute, man. Yeah, actually, I would like our firm to be incentivized for speed because we can beat the other firms on this. If we go into a pitch, we're going to kill the other firms. We're going to win this pitch because we'll do it for the same price, but we'll do it in half as much time. Let's say three quarters, three quarters. Let's not get too extreme. Which then frees up the team to do another job. So, you know, you could actually boost the productive output of your fee earners by 30, 40% today. And the partners are going to share in that windfall. Yeah, I, I, I find it really, really, that's one of the weirdest things is convincing equity partners that even though they make a million, two million, three million a year, that they could actually be even richer if they embrace technology. Because I think beating people over the head saying you're very, very, very naughty, you're very, very efficient, inefficient, it's not a great way to sell something. I mean, I could be wrong, but people telling me that I'm bad doesn't generally endear me to them. You know, yeah. I certainly found that with, with Ravel when we were selling legal research and analytics technology into law firms, it was difficult to get traction when you were talking about speed. It was Mm -hmm. a lot easier to get traction when you were talking about gaining a competitive edge Mm -hmm. and kind of de-risking your knowledge gaps, making sure you understood everything you possibly could about a judge or a deal or a case. Let's open that question up to the audience. So we've got Mm -hmm. one more poll question, which is around what's holding back AI adoption in your organization, maybe that's a uh, a loaded phrasing of it, but be interesting to see what uh, what's going on out there with folks. So, Richard, you know, as we wait for that question to get answered, where do you think do you, do you think it's most likely that so in the in the framing of say Clayton Christensen, right, with um, yeah, with innovation dilemma. Yeah, a lot of what we've just been talking about is maybe the notion that the latest technology is sustaining, right? It's going to modify, but in gentle ways, traditional models versus Mm -hmm. uh, a more disruptive, 
I guess, capsizing of mm. the existing approaches. Um, do you think that sort of disruption, maybe it's uh, a, a low chance, it's a 12% probability, I think, in your estimation, but mm. where is that disruption if it does come most likely to come from? Is it going to come from existing law firms doing it themselves, from corporate teams reimagining their operations or from another part of the market? I think I think it will. I think the people who will probably jump on it the most will probably be that it's a very, very particular group of firms who are good enough and respected enough to get their hands on some really good work, really top deals, but are outside that New York elite, they're outside that magic circle type of firm um who they've probably spent a lot of time thinking about building their own alsp division they've probably got a legal ops consulting group they've probably got a really good internal innovation team and not just a km team with the, with with the letters km rubbed out and the word innovation inserted instead but like a real innovation team that's really constantly working with everyone in the firm to think of new strategies new projects really building and testing and driving things forwards um, I think those firms, I think, have got everything to gain and nothing to lose. Uh, I think perhaps some of the UK firms that are under a lot more pressure uh, at the top, I can imagine. They're actually quite innovative in, in a way that some of the top New York firms are not, because perhaps at the very, very top of the global tree, you don't feel that same pressure in the UK. Even the Magic Circle are, are working hard on driving things forward because I think they have to because there's just more competitive pressures um, on a global scale uh, if you're based in the UK. Interesting. So we got uh, some okay. Yeah, yeah. Accuracy. Accuracy. Wait, but what should we should we do should we do the hallucination? I mean, I'm kind of I'll be honest. I'm deadly bored of the hallucination thing, and 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 um, uh, the reason why I'm bored of it is because we're 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 we're, we're kind of missing a step. It's like is Chat GPT. Uh, the equivalent of a Harvard law professor that you could absolutely trust with your life when it comes to a legal question. Well, no, of course not. It's a chatbot. It's a very, very cool chatbot. It's basically, it's just a chatbot. I mean, you know, you know, it's been oversold, right? Um, yeah, crazy. Um, but if you put in the guardrails, if you put in the guardrails, you know, like, you know, like Case Text has done with their legal research. And, you know, if you look at, say, like Robin AI, which they've done, you know, they're, and I'm sure you guys have too. We can get to that in a moment. You know, you're going to get you're getting accurate responses, right? You know, you're you're not just taking raw responses from a single shot prompt. And this is something that Dan Katz was was saying to me a couple of months ago. That you know, the assumption that you first of all, just using ChatGPT and basing your understanding of LM outputs from that is a bad idea because you're just getting like crazy stuff out of it. Secondly, a lot of people are just putting in a single prompt and just going. Hmm. That's not very good. So well, yeah, what, what do you expect? <laughs> you know, what do you expect? It's nuts. You know, so I think expectations, the crazy expectations have now led to disillusionment. And then, of course, because we had that story about the guy in New York who did the silly case thing. I mean, but that I think that's a sideshow. It's a sideshow. It really yeah, is. I, I, don't think, I, I, don't think those, I don't think those issues are relevant in the least bit. I mean, they're, they, they're, to, they're a total red herring. I think the real issue is about finding legal tech companies who know what they're doing, who've got the right architecture around them, who've got the guardrails, who can convincingly do POCs if you can go, look, we, you know, test the hell out of this, test it until the wheels fall off. It works. We, you know, run it, do an A-B test with a room full of associates and law librarians and, you know, and yeah. check it out. That's what people should be worrying about, engaging with the legal tech companies. Yeah, that's been our experience too. So we launched this feature called AI Revise that is built on some of our other machine learning. So our machine learning, you know, over the last five years has been designed to spot an issue within a contract. And when we flag that issue, we'll provide a suggestion about how to fix it. But we use GPT to say, when we've spot this issue, if you want us to implement a fix for you, we can use GPT to create a red line and it'll insert really elegantly. It'll delete the right words. It'll harmonize with the rest of the contract, but it didn't do that off the shelf. Like when we were testing it off the shelf, it was not successful nearly often enough or at the quality levels where you'd be like, this is good enough for a professional use case. And so it took the infrastructure of having a team that was already familiar with machine learning and data science 
and having legal expertise to then train it and test those iterations over multiple months to get to a point where you're like, this is now professional grade and we've built the infrastructure around it to make sure that when it's outputting results, we know that it's trustworthy and it's grounded in, in trustworthy content. But that's one of the interesting things to me about what it opens up, which is that the traditional way as a legal tech company, you would build features is you'd have to construct a team of PhDs and evaluations and test data and training data. You needed this whole full stack, which was quite expensive and specialized to build if you were going to do it right and really add value. Mm. And I think you still need some of that stack because you can't do all of these things with LLMs right off the shelf. You'd, but, and you'd be drafted, you'd be, and also you'd, you, I mean, you're, you're, I mean, I don't know what you call it in the US, but your professional indemnity insurer would have a heart attack if you just said, yeah, we've just thrown away all the compliance people. We don't need them anymore. <laughs> you know, um, no, but, but actually you've raised a really good point. And, let, and I, we did, I did mention in a couple of tweets that we probably talk about this. So let me just ask you while we're on the subject from your experience, because you started with NLP, like many, many other founders, and now you're using an LM technology to do similar things. How have you found the difference? What, what, and what in terms of the outputs and in terms of just utilizing it? You know, so for example, as you say, you don't need a ton of training data yourself. At least the, the end user doesn't have to bring 50,000 documents to make sure that they're getting the right outputs because hopefully you'll have done that for them. Right. So maybe just talk us through the difference between NLP circa 19, well, circa 2015 yeah. and LLM circa 2023. Yeah, I'll answer that and then we'll open it up to questions. So, yeah, yeah I mean, one of the things that's just so interesting is how quickly it has changed over the last five, six years. The way that you would build a system today is quite different than how we were building them just five years ago. And so the traditional kind of pre-LLM machine learning, you know, became and was strong at things like extracting information from text, classifying text, identifying things within text. But you needed a lot of training data to do that. You needed uh, this data science stack, essentially, of people and technology and infrastructure to do that. Um, and I think in some ways that approach is still needed today, right? Like there are tasks where those traditional approaches are still better than what you can do with LLMs. But with LLMs and like generative AI, I think you have capabilities around summarization, as you noted, drafting, generating text, having this conversational interface where you can, it's essentially kind of a coding language where all you need to learn how to speak is English, right? Um, and that opens up things that you, you know, are diverse and different from extraction and classification. And Gen AI and the LLMs are not bad at those other tasks as well, but they're not necessarily as consistently good, um, particularly in specialized domains. So I think that's one of the differences. Um, you know, this, that generative capability is really, in some places, you know, it might be uh, a continuation, sort of a building upon stuff that's existed before. But in in some instances, that even if it is that, it feels like such a step change in how better, how much better it is that. It's kind of like different, different in kind. So, um, so from, yeah. but, but with, with the guardrails that you've put in, and you know the, the you know the effectively you know safety procedures, you might say that you've that you've installed. If you had to, let's say, let, let's take a classic example that one of your clients or potential clients might have. Let's say they've got a five-page sales agreement. It's a relatively complex company that sells relatively complex products. It's four or five pages long. This sales agreement, um, they've got to review it. Which would probably be better, a traditional NLP tool that's been trained on a couple of thousand examples of this, or an LLM tool that also you believe has been prepped enough? I mean, what, what what's going to be better, or, or or is that actually a wrong question? I don't know. You tell me. It it is a it's a it's an important question. I think one that everybody is still exploring right now. What I think we could confidently say is, if you just dumped that kind of contract into ChatGPT and said, review this contract and spot issues, it would not do a professional level job. And so regardless of the approach, I think you would need to build out. Um, so our approach would be to say, hey, we've built a lot of training using traditional approaches to spot at a very granular level, sentence by sentence within that five page contract. And you layer up the sort of Lego blocks of spotting potentially hundreds of different issues that you've trained to look for and you've identified are important. 
And so that process is very inspectable, right? You know what goes into it. You say, this is what good looks like. Here are the issues we're going to look for. We can test and train each component to see whether we're successfully doing that. And so traditional approaches are quite inspectable. Whereas with an LLM, if you dump it into GPT, say, tell me what the issues are, you don't have any inspectability of that. Um, but that's not to say that LLMs can't be, you know, probably with the right infrastructure trained and adapted to do some of those same tasks. But it's not clear that they're they're there yet, and they're definitely not there yet off the shelf. So I'm going to invite um, Corey in to help us moderate the Q and A. I know he's been keeping an eye on it. So Corey, guide us through this. What are you what are you seeing in the from the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'll just read through a number of different questions that have been up, upvoted. Um, and as more questions come up, uh, please put them into the Q&A and I'll, I'll try to read through them as well. Well, actually, Corey, before you carry on, just saying that if, if I'm happy to hang on for quite a while if you are down as well. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely go over. Yeah. OK, guys, so if, if people in the audience want to keep going, we'll we'll keep with you. Awesome. So the first question is from Adam Ziegler. Assuming responsible use, meaning no confidential data revealed and no blind reliance, how long before it's viewed as unethical for lawyers not to use generative AI to extend or enhance what they do themselves? And then a related question is, how, how do you feel about lawyers having a strict no AI policy? Interesting. Well, okay, I'll just very quickly go on to that. I remember writing an article about that years ago in relation to the first wave about NLP. And I remember looking at the solicitors uh, regulation authority rules uh, for lawyers, uh, for solicitors in England and Wales. And there is there's this very, 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 very vague paragraph in the rules about doing your best for the clients. But I don't know, in the US, I guess you've got individual bar bar associations in every state so it'd be very 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 tricky but i mean i mean you've got the thing about tech competence and tech awareness haven't you various states have implemented that you know lawyers have to be aware of technology but it doesn't necessarily say that they have to use it and they have to use it in the interest of their clients they don't say they have to use it in the interest of their clients to reduce cost that hasn't been spelled out as far as i understand certainly not the case in the uk uh, i think in in the years to come i think there's a i think it's a really good question i think that if we're going to talk about ethics and AI, is there not an economic, uh, ethical issue that uh, any professional, and I don't, don't, I'm not just talking about lawyers here, but accountants, investment bankers, everybody, to do the most effective thing that is reasonable based on the cost of the job and the resources of that professional business? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question, Adam. I guess I'm probably pr fairly skeptical that it will become something that's considered unethical not to use, given that, you know, even today, I routinely see legal work that, you know, hasn't used spell check or, you know, law firms sending you documents that aren't teed up in DocuSign. <laughs> you know, just massive time wasters and uh, technologists existed forever. Um, that said, you know, I think if you draw an analogy to medicine, right, you'd say there are diagnostic tools, tests, MRIs, x-rays, sort of a duty of care, duty of standard of care, right, that maybe you'd start to see apply in particular use cases in law. And legal research is obviously one sort of if you're doing research, it's got to be on uh, comprehensive databases and trustworthy sources, but you could imagine big document sets or um, yeah, so I, I think it's sort of use case by use case. And, and I think that's hard to draw a line around whether it's, um, I wouldn't say it's sort of unethical broadly not to be using technology, but I do think you'd be missing out on, on a lot of opportunities from an economic sense, as Richard pointed out. But Dan, I think you made a really good point about medicine. Uh, I mean, most people have health insurance policies, don't they? and there are different grades and if all the hollywood movies i've seen about people being cheated of the uh the medical care they're, they're, they're hoping to get it's usually because they want to use an mri scanner and some guy walks in and says you know, sorry you know it's not on your insurance policy and then you know the drama starts or whatever um that's an interesting one isn't it because if you apply that to legal you know let's say that a very very large corporate has got x law firm on its panel and they're pretty buddy-buddy. The law firm expects to be on this panel until you know the end of time. 
and they've almost they, have, they don't exactly have like a licensing agreement as such but it almost like feels like that you could kind of say the it wouldn't be that strange for the client to say look we the these are the terms right you we expect you to use technology in these situations we're going to outline it and these are the kind of economic or efficiency gains we expect you to deliver and if you don't want to do that that's cool you know but you're not our primary law firm anymore i mean that would be really interesting i mean we definitely saw that in the analytics space, right? You would have law firms that would make it a point of winning deals and competing for business by pointing out how much more they knew about a lawsuit or a potential judge than the competition. And I think that that analogy holds to sort of the hospital setting, right? Would you rather go to the hospital that has all the best gear, all the best equipment, or to a hospital that doesn't use any of that? Um, well, that but, you, but that only, I mean, the gear, I mean, I suppose the difference is, is that in medicine, we believe and probably rightly most of the time that a hospital with all the great new kit is going to help us more than the hospital that has no kit at all and a rickety old you know iron yeah. bed kind of thing um because it probably does right does a law firm with super cool ai that never actually uses it on any of its billable work make any difference yeah. right um does using ai actually reduce risk interesting i think on probably legal research it probably does because you're going to get a better spread of cases you're going to get more in depth you're going to get more gnarly data um i think people need to do some analysis on this i mean it'd be really really interesting to show on the in-house side at least for relatively simple contracts over a period of time say six to twelve months that legal teams or contract management teams who use x technology that is supported by AI to review and do compliance checks, reduced lawsuits or reduced, you know, escalated issues by X amount. That would be a cool piece of data to have. Um, I think one of the issues, actually, that's a very good question in so many ways, because I think one of the challenges we have is a real scarcity of solid data. There's all kinds, even every week there's a new poll about, you know, they've asked like an enormously broad range of people, like almost like going to a shopping mall and just saying who likes ai put your hands up you know i mean it's very 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 broad so broad i'm not really sure how, how, how valuable many of them are and it doesn't really tell us very much you know are you scared about ai you know put your hand up kind of thing um but what about some solid data to go on you know let's let's actually start collecting data about the people who use these tools to actually show what the actual tangible benefits were and then we've got some sort of foundation to build upon because at the moment it's just people like making mad guesses isn't it it's like when are all the lawyers going to go <laughs> you know it's like and actually and to answer the, the final question it was the second question it was uh what about law firms who say no ai um i think in some ways we've kind of answered that haven't we really that we, it, it's pretty hard to make a hard and fast rule yeah, I'm I don't think those sorts of rules will last for very long, right? They feel um, reactive to me and very stopgap and say, hey, you know, we we don't have something system wide for people to use and we don't want people going into their general personal chat GPT and that makes sense. I mean, yeah, I mean, in the same way that you would you'd say that, you know, if you're if you're in the deal room on a, on an IPO we'd really like it if you didn't just jump onto Twitter and tell everybody that you're working on an IPO because yeah. that would be really bad guys, you know? <laughs> so yeah, don't jump onto GPT and start asking it deal questions, you know? So, but you'd be very silly to do that. So maybe, maybe banning use of chat GPT in the raw makes sense, but to ban all the use of any legal technology that uses AI, well, then you'd have to stop using Lexis and you'd have to stop using Westlaw which would be quite a blow to a lot of people. So, yeah, I think it, it's, it's an interesting question. Sure there's another a, one, Corey? Yeah, there's another question uh, from a different angle. I keep hearing about technology replacing low-value work. Associates will be asked to do higher-value work earlier in their career, but how do those associates get trained? I'm not saying low-value work is used for training, but the burden of training will go up more for senior lawyers. How will that work out? Ultimately, the key legal skill is judgment. How will that be trained and modeled in the new AI legal environment? Good question. I think, Dan, as, you, as a lawyer, you're a lawyer by background, aren't you? Yeah. I think you should go for this one. It's a, yeah, it's a, I'm not sure I have any right answers on it. But I, I think a lot of folks would tell you that what you actually learn in law school is not really 
sufficient training to then go out and practice law. You know, we see this on the in-house side. Most folks say, yeah, you know, if we're reviewing contracts, it's not that you learned how to review a SAS agreement in law school. So you're getting trained on the job. Oftentimes you're not getting any formal training. You're just sort of thrown in and then instructed to, to figure it out. Um, so, you know, the way that I think of our technology in that context is this is a technology that can assist you and support you. It gives you a safety net. It gives you guidance. It gives you some education as you do that review about why different things matter, how, uh, why certain risks are greater than other risks, and what are practical ways to understand market norms or standards about that. Um, and I don't think that kind of usage of AI necessarily um, shortcuts a training process. I think in some ways it can accelerate. It can say, here's how you actually get in and start being effective and adding value on these kinds of tasks. Um, so yeah, I don't know. In other, in other areas, you definitely hear this coming up, right? People saying, well, if you didn't have to do grunt work the hard way, if you didn't have to go to the, the library stacks to look at the, the case law books, did you really learn how to do case law research? And I don't think those sorts of arguments have really held up with time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you can really say with a straight face that somebody's a worse researcher today because they never had to go to the library stacks and look at hard copy books. So I think in general, people adapt fairly intuitively and naturally to these technologies that are accelerants and supportive. Um, but I'd be curious your view on it, Richard. Yeah, I, I broadly agree. I mean, I mean, I had a really interesting Twitter chat with Damien Real um from sally um uh, about the, the the idea of using um, llm technology to effectively get you halfway through developing ideas and then take it from there and i was kind of arguing against that because you're taking their frame of reference so philosophically you know obviously there's multiple ways of thinking you know even in the west there are multiple ways of thinking there are different um foundational starting point so if you if you accept the starting point of an llm you're already trapped within it it's like climbing halfway up a tree you know you're, you're, you're kind of stuck in that tree um however that this is about creative thought right and i think creative thought really should be reserved to humans um however if it's donkey work if it's here's a contract please read it and find the change of control clause have a look at the change of control clause and look at our playbook is it the same I don't see what anybody is learning from that at all. I mean, you know, an intelligent 10 year old could do that. I don't see why go, getting, you know, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in debt to, for law school it should result in you having to do that. I don't see how that helps. I mean, I'm not a lawyer by background, as most people know. So I'm going to, I'm going to end it there because I'll leave it to Daniel, who actually is a lawyer. Um, but yeah, I, and also, you could also, I suppose one last point would be, is doesn't it, isn't it the obligation of the legal industry to move with the times and train young lawyers for whatever it is that's coming next? There's no point in law schools just standing still and, you know, teaching exactly the same way they did in the 1980s and the training team at law firms going, you know, silly associates, you don't understand how to, you know, um, think deductively about legal issues. It's like, well, teach them. You know, take some time out of billable work and teach them, you know, <laughs> anyway. That sort of brings a related question regarding how law firm or how law schools prepare students for this new paradigm of AI. Well, I'll just, I'll, re I'll reiterate the point. Teach people to think and teach people to think for themselves. Get rid of exams. Um, all, get rid of all exams uh, past the age of 18. Um, except for pilots and surgeons. <laughs> That's just my own radical view. Um, and test people on their ability to think and deliver and generate business structure and an educational system that streamlines and focuses on that, because that's how we're going to develop as a society. Uh, pieces of paper don't make you clever. And if you reward only getting pieces of paper, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a lot of people who are good at getting bits of paper. Um, if you if you have a society that creates independent free thinkers, we're going to move a lot faster and we'll create more value as a society, not just in the legal world, but across the entire economy.
I think that's a good answer. Let's let's leave it at that one. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I, I, one. I, should, I should caveat that I'm, that view is not shared by most universities. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I do think the generative capabilities pose a, a really interesting dilemma to to how do you teach and test, right? So if you don't take Richard's position about exams, how do you test knowledge if you let people take these exams at home using generative AI? Um, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that GPT writes at the level of a, you know, a, a pretty good high school or maybe even a, an early collegiate uh, student. And I think it's pretty easy to imagine that within the next year or two, it'll be writing at an even higher quality level. And so um, the, the teaching the skill of writing will become a really interesting task. And I wonder whether it'll be more about teaching a skill of editing versus first drafting. But you do have Richard's challenge, which is like the frame of reference matters. You know, you're editing something that has already set a frame versus creating from scratch. And sometimes I, thinking from scratch is I, the I, important I, way of, of learning and and coming up with ideas so a lot of interesting challenges there no i think i think we should do what the french do um which is you know um i spent a lot of time in france and you know the kids there until well till recently anyway were taught philosophy as teenagers and not just like sort of like mcdonald's sort of like you know pathetic very very easy to, to digest version but like hard philosophy but like there are different schools of thought kids you know, uh, let's understand, understand, you know, logic. Let's understand how you can arrive at different conclusions following different logic paths and so forth. Uh, you know, taught to think. Um, you know, that would be awesome. That would be, I mean, honestly, I mean, most, most of the time, whenever we get into technology, it simply becomes a mirror that allows us to look back at ourselves. We, I think the more interesting discussions around technology tend to be when the we start to look at concepts that relate to technology, but then they're sort of pushed back onto us and go, so yeah, for example, what are we teaching? Why are we teaching? You know, where are we trying to get to? Uh, you know, what is thinking? You know, what, what, do we want people who think? Uh, I'd say yes. <laughs> Some people would say no. Damn those thinking people. You know, let's have less of that. Um, anyway, Corey, uh, is AI moving or changing too fast right now for lawyers or even legal tech startups to keep up? Mm, no, I would say it's changing incredibly fast. Um, too fast to keep up. I don't even quite know, uh, how to react to that question though. I, I mean, I think it's one of these things where there are a lot of interesting developments week by week, um, new models coming out, new capabilities within models, uh, flaws that are getting corrected. Um, but I don't think that means it's it's moving too fast for folks to wade into the waters and start using it. And, and they're certainly gonna start using applications of it that others have spent the time building out and testing and training. Um, and yeah, I do, I think, you know, so there's another question embedded in that, which is, should folks wait and see, should they wait until the dust settles? And I've heard some folks say that, and I would answer, I don't, I can't see the dust settling anytime soon, honestly. If you think it's all going to become clear six months from now and two winners will have emerged and everything's sorted out. Um, I think there's probably a lot more creative creativity that's going to be happening over the next five years and beyond that um, it's not going to be, it's not going to be so clear and simple if you just wait. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and, the, and there could be first mover advantages, uh, both for law firms and here in-house legal teams, because I think people who are very up to speed with this tech will be more valuable in the market, not just to their company, to, to other companies and for, for law firms, I think just sitting on your hands and waiting until 2026 and going, hey, we would have figured it out by then, you know. I think it's very risky. It's very, very, very risky. I mean, what happens if the market, you know, let's say it really does accelerate even faster than it is now, and you've just decided not to even think about these issues, you know, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing this, you know, out, out of, I mean, I should be on sabbatical. I should be, you know, in the Himalayas or something. But, you know, it's important for me as someone who holds events on innovation to know what is going on you know, and to engage in this and to think about it. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think the idea of just closing your mind off is nutty 
It's a really bad idea. Don't wait. Don't wait. I mean, one thing you could do if you're talking to a company, say, what's your roadmap? You know, we don't, you know, obviously we don't expect you to be, you know, um, you know, have this incredible ability to see the future, but we would expect you to have a roadmap. So if things do accelerate, if things do change. How do you, how do you think you're going to change? You know, do you have at least some half decent answers to give us? Um, you know, I mean, most law firms that I've met, the innovation teams are want to work with you. They want a trusted partner, and same with the legal ops and in-house legal teams. They want a trusted partner to work with. It's not an adversarial relationship. You know, they want trusted um, tech companies who can, you know, come to uh, you know develop a long-standing relationship. So I would say, get in there, build relationships, and learn. Um, don't lock yourself into a twenty-year contract, probably, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> And are there applications for lawyers who want to make the world a better place and not get rich uh, to leverage tech to make sort of an impact on access to justice issues? I certainly think so. I mean, I think that's one of the most wide open parts of the market, which is we know that there's this massive unmet demand for legal services, unmet because the gap between what people are able and willing to pay and what legal services cost them is too big. And I think that's true with individuals and it's true with a lot of small businesses. There's a lot of legal advice that's not sought out, not asked for because folks assume, and, and it's true that they can't afford it and they're not willing to, to pay 300, 400, 500 an hour to get their questions answered. So I think it's in that space where the technology maybe hasn't been ready. Maybe it hasn't been ready to really serve that market super well, but I think it, it's becoming clearer in, in sight that the technology may be approaching a place where delivering legal services really at scale at a price point that opens up demand could be really powerful. And, and potentially, you know, that, that to me might be the place where the biggest disruption starts to happen. You, you sort of have this proving ground of a market that's ripe, that um, tech enabled or tech, you know, tech only legal services starts to prove out there and maybe moves up up market from there totally agree i mean and the interesting thing is a lot of consumer law is on a fixed fee i mean at least in the uk um you know a lot of a lot of stuff is fixed fee um the, the trick of course is getting the law firms the small law firms you've got a law firm say i don't five six people the senior partner is 60 he or she uh, is basically thinking about retirement and then their professional insurance uh, liability, if they retire and how they're going to pay that off, they're worried about, you know, renewing the lease and all that kind of stuff and what to do with the photocopier, you know, which they still use. Um, getting them to engage is, is difficult. I mean, I've met people who tried to sell into the consumer market law firm kind of field. And the problem is the high cost of sales. So now if, you, if you go to the 50 biggest law firms in the world, together, their revenues are multiple billions, right? If you could get uh, licenses with half of those, or well, you're off to the races and everyone's happy. Yeah, and you're also going to get a massive amount of usage because these are big firms. Um, you've got for every 10 little mom and pop law firm that you meet, you might get one license if you're lucky and the usage is going to be tiny relative to a big firm so i mean it's interesting that i, mean, I think the, the question really is not that can it work and i think it absolutely can absolutely can and i think generative ai particularly because particularly because it can be made very conversational it works nicely in this field um i think it's more about will uh the the providers evolve i mean i, I would i mean i'm guessing and i don't know if anyone from clio is listening but clio as far as i understand i don't know much about the company really but does cover a broader range of firms they you could imagine them because they've got all those links with smaller firms already being able to build out into that field and do more access to justice stuff but it's a tough one isn't it because you, you know faster cheaper doesn't mean worse quality there's no point a provider coming into the market with some kind of chat bot that can give legal answers that is inaccurate or is going to get into all kinds of issues with the local bars you know you need a really really proficient on top of it company who's providing absolutely great results who has enough capital to go into the market and sell to thousands and thousands of small law firms 
on a who have very 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 small tech budgets it's you know i think again it's, it's strangely it all comes back to economics again i mean you know if, if i if i personally was going to launch a legal tech company i would really think twice about trying to build such a company unless i had some huge backers who were like don't worry about it mate you've got like 10 years to make a profit and like here's like 100 million dollars and off you go i'd be like okay cool but if they were like you know here's a million and we want five times revenue in two years i'd be like oh my god you know i mean how are we going to do that so um yeah let's talk to, i mean talk to maya markovich if she's if she's online um justice tech um out in california uh they're doing some really really good work and also lex lab um at um, hastings in uh, san francisco there's a ton of good stuff going on around trying to get investors tech companies and access to justice experts all together to try and solve these problems but i think the, the key actually is, is an economic one Let's take one or two more, Corey, and then, uh, and then we'll call it a wrap. Yeah, absolutely. Um, related to sort of consumers law, consumer law and often that being fixed fee, uh, what about fixed fee in sort of corporate um, and major banks? How can a firm that competes for these clients quickly switch to fixed fees? Well, I, well, I'll... So just very, very briefly, I would simply say you have the data, a bank, if the bank does not have the data, except for massive stuff like being sued for competition issues by the EU, which probably happens once every 50 years, the bank will have a ton of data. The law, the stuff that it gets the law firms to do for it, it, they will also have a ton of data. If they cannot put their heads together and come up with some rational fixed fees, I would be amazed. However, if they still can't, I would say, partition out a particular area of work almost the kind of work that an ALSP would do and start off with that model it out put it on a fixed fee see how it goes see how the client likes it and then build outwards I mean you don't have to turn the entire 5,000 lawyer firm into a fixed fee monster overnight start off with something small do it bite-sized chunks and then build outwards and develop your your data and your pricing models as you go forwards great and Last question, how do law firms, uh, in-house teams, et cetera, discover which legal AI software to buy out, to try out? Well, they've got we to follow the artificial lawyer, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Although not, not today, because I'm on sabbatical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, actually, um, you should come, come, to, come to the Legal Innovators events. Uh, there's one in California, Legal Innovators California in June, and Legal Innovators uh, UK, which is in London in November. Um, there you go. That's my <laughs> that's my plug. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a really interesting space to watch over the last 10 years, right? When I started Ravel in 2012, you could count the number of legal tech companies on, I think, your hands and your feet. And then over the next 10 years, we saw this explosion of hundreds and then thousands of companies that are in legal tech. And partly it's because the space is so big that you can call something legal tech if it's dealing with probation, just as if it's dealing with law firm legal research. It's just there's uh, massive, massive uh, corners of the market. Um, but partly just because you saw this, you know, ramp up in venture capital, the number of people who wanted to start companies. Um, and so I think it's folks like Richard who help everybody else sort through you know, what's good and what's bad, kind of what's real, what's not, what actually has backing, what doesn't, what has real use cases, what are people saying? Um, because otherwise there's a, there's a lot out there. Um, and so I think there is a, there's some work that needs to be done going beyond just a, you hear about a company, you want to understand kind of what's its backing. Because as Richard noted, it can take a long time. It can take a lot of capital to build meaningful companies in the space. Um, What's the traction? What are the real use cases? What are users saying about it? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I'd say that if you're serious about this, you know, you're probably a large law firm, a large in-house legal team, you know, just just, just say to yourself, look, this is the future. Uh, I don't think it's going to move as fast as the hype wave suggests, but I am 100% certain it's going to make a significant difference and that, that difference is going to grow and grow and grow. If that is the case, then invest, invest in learning about it. Bring the bring the top companies in, and do some POCs. You know, um, it's not that complicated. 
you know, there's only there's only that many. I mean, you know, you might there aren't like hundreds and hundreds of these. There's, there's you know, if there's a particular use case that you're looking for, a quick zoom around the legal tech internet will tell you there's four or five probably who are a good fit. Bring them in, bring them all in, do some do some tests, you know, do some bake offs, um, you know. In, I would say invest some time in this. This is this is not a novelty. This is not a marketing exercise. This is for real, and it's going to have a significant impact on your in-house legal team and your law firm for many years to come. So that's a good place to end it. I think um, we'll be hosting another webinar. Um, legal on will be hosting another webinar with three GCs on August second, discussing the path to becoming a GC at a venture-backed company and tips and advice for being successful as a first-time GC. So stay tuned for more information about that um, in terms of time and registration link. We'll also send out a link to the recording of this webinar with more information and links to Legal On and Artificial Lawyer. Um, so thanks everybody for attending. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I think we we both agreed that there's so much ground we might we might have to do another one of these. Um, yeah. yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah. Um, and with that, we'll let folks get back to the rest of their day or their evening. And uh, thanks for joining us.